tomorrow is Veterans Day. We had the parade here in Auburn, and right now we want to honor all the veterans who are here with us. If you've served our country, please stand up right now and remain standing. That's right. Please remain standing. We want to pray for you and your families. We appreciate you. We love you. Uh, let's pray together. Father God, thank you for these who are standing right here. God, we pray that they would sense how honored they are. Uh, Lord, we know that freedom carries a lot of responsibility, and there's people who have really carried an extra portion of that responsibility. And God, we are so grateful. We pray you bless these people, bless their families as well. God, across our land, comfort and encourage families of loved ones who have loved ones who are serving right now as well. God, and we pray for wisdom for our leaders. Lord, that they would make wise decisions and honor you. And God, we are so grateful for our veterans, and we pray that they would sense your great love for them uh, as they move forward and follow you with all their hearts. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, well, uh, in two weeks, we have an event here coming up. It's a meal, a Thanksgiving meal. We call it Thankful Hearts, and it's going to be on Monday the 25th. Hundreds of people. It's a beautiful night. Hundreds of people will come from our community to enjoy a meal here with us, and we serve together so you can prepare food, you can bring food, serve food, clean up, you can host a table. There's lots of opportunities. Check out the uh, table in the lobby, and uh, you can get involved. We really, we do it together. It's an amazing night. Also, a week from today, we have our family meeting. That's twice a year, and it's a chance to hear about ministry, finances in a very transparent way. Also, vision for the future. It's 1215 next Sunday. And the last thing I want to mention is Orphan Weekend. Across the country right now, it's Orphan Weekend, and we have a video to share with you. So please take a look at the screen, open your hearts, and let's watch this video together. My child, you are my work of art. My hands have molded you from birth. But my heart aches. I see my children who are hurting. They're cast aside like worthless clay. I long to restore, heal, and make beautiful. Will you join me? My hands will guide yours. There is much to do and much joy to find. And don't be surprised when my children mold you. I work in their lives through you and in your life through them. Be like me to my little ones. Love them as I love them. Love them as I have loved you. Every two seconds, there's another child in this world that becomes an orphan. And in Africa this year, there'll be two million children that will become orphans. 
You know how many orphans there are around the world? 140 million orphans. I think, who's going to take care of them? It's very clear in Scripture. God commands us to look after the orphans. That is pure religion. That's following the Lord. In our country, we have 24,000 children who will age out of the foster care system this year, and they don't have forever families. And in Auburn, I was looking around statistics. In Auburn, 250 kids now in the foster care system. That's far more than the cities around us. So it's not just something distant, it's near. A lot of churches are just kind of asleep at the wheel and not stepping up. Our church is stepping up. We're doing it together. It's part of Daily Grace. We have almost 20 families who have now adopted, and there are so many opportunities to get involved, from mentoring to caring, supporting, praying, foster care, a wide range of opportunities. So we want to open up our hearts, give the Holy Spirit access to this part of our lives, and let God lead us. For some people, don't adopt. God isn't calling you to do that. But for others, you need to seriously pray about it and consider it. We have an opportunity this weekend where two incredible ministries, Antioch Adoptions and also Olive Crest, are here for the entire weekend. They have tables. So after the service, you can just stop by, ask them some questions, get some more information. There's a wide range of ways to get involved. And just let God lead you as you get the information. And together, we want to make a difference in the life of orphans, not just locally, but globally as well. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you how you lead us and guide us. And Jesus, we want to return to you today. It's honestly so easy for us to drift off and be distracted or be self-consumed and not trust you. And we want to return to you, Jesus, with all of our heart. We're not here just to go through religious motions or to show up at church. We're so grateful to be together in your presence with us, but we also sense that there's so much purpose in our time here together. Uh, Lord, change our hearts as we commit them to you. In your name we pray, amen. The main point of this message is if you don't guide your heart, your heart will guide you. That's right. If you don't guide your heart, it will guide you. Have you ever been in a situation where someone told you, they gave you some advice, and they said, just go with your heart? By show of hands, have you ever heard that from someone? They told you, just go with your heart. Yeah, most people here. Have you ever just gone with your heart and then looked back later and realized, oh, that didn't go quite as well as I thought that was going to go? Well, our hearts are complex. There's so many good things that come out of our heart, but then there's other things that come out of our heart. And let's consider what Jesus says about our hearts. Matthew chapter 15, starting in verse 18, Jesus says this, But the things that come out of a person's mouth come from the heart, and these defile them. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. Lots of things come out of our hearts that aren't healthy. And we're trying to discern, all right, should we just go with our heart? Should we not go with our heart? What we learn from Jesus is sometimes our hearts are deceptive. And sometimes our hearts will actually veer us off the path. But Jesus is committed to healing our hearts. Jesus is committed to the deepest transformation. And we all need healing in our hearts. We all need a deep transformation from Jesus. And we're going to look at this process of wholeness that Jesus brings to our lives. Now, three stages today and from the text. The first one is the reveal. And here's a question for each of the stages. With the reveal of our heart, the question is, what have you chosen as your treasure? Every day, you're choosing your treasure. You could look back over this last year and it'll be evident. What did you treasure? Who did you treasure this last year? Jesus explains in Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 19. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. Listen to this verse. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I want to say it again. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye of the lamp is the lamp of the body. And if your eyes are good, your whole body is full of light. But if your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? For no one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, 
or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. First, this passage is not teaching that it's foolish to have a savings account. Uh, the Bible it goes over and over again. Good stewardship includes some savings. This passage does not teach it's foolish to have retirement. Uh, this passage does not teach you should stop enjoying your blessings. And you know what? You shouldn't have any possessions. This passage is twisted in many ways that are not accurate to the text. Also, there's not a clever way around this passage. You cannot say, well, moths and insects, we have insects repellent. Okay, uh, mice... We've got mouse traps. Rust, we've got rust-proof paint. Thieves breaking into the house, we have a house alarm. This doesn't apply. Uh, that's not the way this passage rolls out. They had those issues back then. Rusting meant eating. They had mice that would come into the barns. Their walls were clay, very thin, so criminals could break into the house very easily. The point is these blessings aren't permanent, and the things that we see are not going to last. What does this passage teach? Jesus brings three contrasts. Your treasures are in heaven or on earth. You choose light or you choose darkness, and you serve God or you serve money. And if you've been around church for a while or you studied your Bible for a while, you're like, I know the right answers. Uh, treasure in heaven, I'll take light, and also God, not money. Did I get it? Yeah, that's right. All three right answers. But this passage isn't about the right answers, and it's not about how we feel like the condition of our heart is in. It's about how things actually are. Very different from what feels like to how things actually are. So there's three heart locators that Jesus brings because you want to say, well, where is my heart? Where exactly is my treasure in my heart? Well, here's three things. First of all, your spending reveals your heart. If you look at the return from your credit card or your checking account, and you look, where are you investing your money? That reveals where your heart is. Here's the second one, your eyes. Your eyes tell a story. You know, if I look at your kneecap or your ankle or your elbow, it doesn't really tell a story. Uh, it looks the same every day, but our eyes tell the story and tell a condition. What are we looking at? What are we fixated on? What's going on in our soul? What's going on in our heart? And then the third one is your serving. Your serving tells a story about uh, how you're using your, your gifts and also how you're loving people and how well you're loving people. That tells a story about where your heart is. These are reveals about where our heart is. Psalm 26, verse 2 is a prayer. I encourage you to pray it this morning. Would you be so bold to pray this? Test me, Lord, and try me. Examine my heart and my mind. God already knows and sees it, but invite him in and this is what it'll boil down to so often. Is your first love your creator or something he created? Is your first love your creator or has it shifted to something he created? And you say, well, kind of both. I mean, sometimes it's a roller coaster ride. I mean, it's usually God, money a little bit, but you know, most of the time. Jesus says you cannot serve two masters. If your answer was both, you've chosen money. If the answer is both, you're trying to ride the fence, no one rides the fence. You're not really serving God when you ride the fence. And so he points this out, and a lot of people will push back and say, well, I don't love money, I don't think about money, I'm not fixated on money. Okay, that's maybe a primary way of seeing it, but look at the secondary way. How many people are locked in to the lifestyle that the money brings? The comfortable aspects. You say, well, that doesn't affect me that much. Oh, really? Have you ever been pulled out of your home? Don't have a car? Uh, don't have the things that you usually have, the comforts? Oh, uh, well, I, I want all those. Okay, maybe God gave them to you and you enjoy them, but the point is, sometimes we're so locked into what's comfortable, we don't even realize that our heart is locked into that and preserving that more than it is to taking risks for the Lord and being available to how the Lord wants to use us. Now, we live in a right-now culture. What's going to help me? What makes me feel good right now? And Jesus stretches us to think long-term in this passage. How about the question this? How much are you going to bring with you to heaven? Out of everything you have right now, how much are you bringing with you to heaven? And the answer for all of us is none of it. None of it. 
So we need to readjust uh, our paradigm and our thinking. Here's an example. I found out this statistic just recently. When it comes to trust in wills, 60% of people don't have one. 30% of people have one that's very outdated. And only 10% of people are ready with their trust and their will. Now, that's not eternity. That's just the end of our lives. But that's part of stewarding. Because if we steward what we have, well, when we pass, our families, our churches. I mean, there's so much good that can be done versus if you don't have one, where's that going to go? This is just an example of some foresight and looking ahead, but ultimately to heaven. John Stott says this, what we keep, we lose. What we give, we have. Catch the paradox? What we keep, we lose. What we give, we have. William Borden, uh, he was going to be the heir of the fortune from the dairy company, the Borden Dairy Company. Well, his parents decided at age 16 they wanted to send him around the world to see the world, and they had the resources to do it. You know what happened as he traveled from country to country? His heart broke because he saw the conditions of the world, and he saw how many people don't know Jesus. And he made a decision at that point, no reserves was his decision. Well, then he went to Yale. He graduated from Yale, and a lot of people tried to encourage him and say, all right, now it's time for the family business. You've got your education. And he said, no regrets. I'm going to Egypt. I'm going to learn Arabic, and I'm going to serve people overseas. I'm going to spread the love of Jesus. No regrets. No reserves. No regrets. And then no retreat. He went there. He died at age 25. Meningitis. And many people said his life was a waste. But his legacy carried on with no reserves, no regrets, no retreats. Do you know how he lived at Yale? He started a Bible study in a prayer time, and it grew. And 150 students started to join him in the morning. By the time he graduated, it was reported that 1,000 students out of a student body of 1,300 got involved in Bible study and turning to Jesus. Do you know what his motto was in life? Say no to self, say yes to Jesus every time. Can you imagine going through life like that? Saying no to self, saying yes to Jesus every time. And ultimately, it doesn't matter if you live 25, 52, 92. Success, true success for all of our lives is being faithful to Jesus. It's not the world's measures. It's being faithful to Jesus. And he saw that clearly. During the week, there's tension because there's things we want to do. And then there's being faithful to Jesus. And sometimes it's difficult to decide. I got to tell you, there's a soccer game going on today. <laughs> I don't know if you've heard, Seattle Sounders going for the cup, 69,000 people, game starts at noon, and I felt some inner tension. <laughs> and some people said, oh, just videotape 9 o'clock and then show it at 1045, you'll be out, sermon's up on the screen, we're all good, you're at the game. There's part of me that wants to go to the game, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. And that little wrestling that happens, it's not like these are bad things. So often in our week, it'll be something good, but it's not the best. I know where God wants me. He wants my heart, my mind right here, preaching, 1045. He wants, you know, that's where God wants me. I do it with joy. I wouldn't pick it otherwise. But yeah, you start to think about, ooh, that could be fun. That could be good. And it's the reveal. Where's our heart? Where is our heart is what Jesus is focusing on. There's the reveal. And then that leads to the traps. Here's the question for the traps. Do you have a worried heart? Do you have a worried heart? If you shift from loving your creator with all your heart to starting to love the created things more, you're going to have a worried heart. If you're primarily preoccupied with created things, including people and stuff, then you're going to have a worried heart. Now, God... And the beauty of his creation inspires us, and we see that in this passage. And I took a couple pictures. I think mountains are a great reminder of God's presence. Beautiful weather the last week, and we like to say the mountains out, don't we, in the Pacific Northwest. Mount Rainier, and I took a picture there, the lake, reflection, and then even up close, and you know, there's the lake, the houses, and the size of Mount Rainier. When you look at Mount Rainier, think of Psalm 125. When I look at the mountains, I think of this psalm. Those who trust in the Lord 
are like Mount Zion, which cannot be shaken but endures forever. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people both now and forevermore. Mountains remind us we don't need to worry. We trust the Lord. He surrounds us. His power, his protection, his presence. And we want to trust him and be solid like that mountain. But then Jesus points out the reality of our hearts and how we so often worry. Look at verse 25. Jesus says, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow? They do not labor or spin, yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow, thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. This passage is not teaching that you shouldn't plan, you shouldn't have foresight, you shouldn't have limits, you shouldn't make adjustments. That's not what this passage teaches. And at the same time, worry is very different than genuine concern. Genuine concern is positive and compassion, and it leads to action. Worry is something very different and unnecessary. Uh, This passage teaches us that the list of things that we can worry about is very long, right? Our body, our clothes, what we eat, what we drink, our life, our health, our future. I mean, isn't the list long of things? We haven't mentioned, you know, earthquakes uh, and, and what people think of us and finances. And you mean, the list is long every day. And here's another piece of news. It's not going to change. It's not going away. Every day we wake up, the list of things we could worry about is massive, that's not going to change. So let's take a look at worry from a few different angles. First, from a physical standpoint, worry is uh, wearing us down. Worry wears us down physically, emotionally. It affects sleep. Worry depletes us. What about logically? Worry has no positive impact. Worry doesn't change anything. You can't add one hour to your life by worrying. So worrying is futile. It's a waste. It's logically a waste. It physically wears us down. And you know what it does relationally? It puts strain on relationships. If you're around someone who's worried all the time, you feel that, don't you? You feel that strain. It can lead to distance. It not just affects our relationships with each other. It affects relationship with God because it's ultimately saying, I don't trust you, God. I don't trust you. I'm not trusting you. And so worry across the board, I think when we analyze it and look at it, we would say, no, thank you. It makes no sense. It's not good. And God comes alongside of us in our worry, loves us in our worry, and with that, he points us towards creation. Our loving Heavenly Father points us towards creation, like the birds, like the grass, like the flowers, the lilies. Spurgeon says this, lovely lilies, how you rebuke our foolish nervousness. Isn't that a great insight? Lovely lilies, how you rebuke our foolish nervousness. John Stott shares a playful poem. Said the robin to the sparrow, I should really like to know why these anxious human beings rush about and worry so. Said the sparrow to the robin, Friend, I think that it must be that they have no heavenly father such as cares for you and me. Playful and convicting too. Uh, When we stop trusting God, we go into worry mode We go into a mode that's over-controlling, over-intense, and it's when we stop trusting God. Have you ever noticed it's really hard to trust God and worry at the same time? It's impossible, isn't it, to really trust God and worry at the same time. So there's the choice that's laid out before us, and we want to guide our hearts because our hearts will drift to worry. We want to guide our hearts to Jesus, and we want to go from worry to worship. And here's an example of someone in our church. Their car was stolen. They woke up Sunday morning excited for church. Their car was stolen. You know what they did? They let the police take care of it, and they got on a bus, 
They came down to church and they worshiped. They could have worried about the stolen car and said, no, I'm going to worship today. You know what happened? The car was recovered, but all the equipment in the car, they didn't find it. And the person said, it's just stuff. It's just stuff. I'm going to hold it loosely. And then they found the person who stole the car and he went to court this last week. And at court, with a sincere heart, the man just looked at the criminal and said, I forgive you. I forgive you. It's all right. I forgive you. And the judge was shocked. But again, we choose, don't we? Not just in a, you know, when things are going nicely, but when life is really challenging, are we going to worship or are we going to worry? Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, guarding your heart. It's so important every day. Proverbs chapter 4, above all else, guard your heart. From Everything you do flows from it. I was a goalkeeper back in the day, so my responsibility was to guard the goal. And it, it's a guarding where you're locked in. And you, you, guarding your heart from impurity, from worry, uh, from pride. You guard your heart. Why do you guard your heart? Because everything flows from your heart. Your words flow from your heart. Your attitude flows from your heart. Your relationships, responses, it flows from your heart. So you guard your heart. And you also receive what Jesus said. You know what a key in this passage is? It's how valuable you are to God. Please don't miss that. That's the key for the healing. It's how valuable you are to God. That his presence is greater than your pain. His promises will endure longer than the trial you're in. His faithfulness is greater than your waywardness. It's not a striving or an earning. It's a realizing and receiving how valuable you are to God. And when you receive, then the worry starts to dissipate. And Jesus also points out that the solution to the worry is going to involve faith. It's going to involve faith. It's a step of faith to let go of the worry. And religious people in his day were lacking that faith. Now, here's a visual a lot of people have to-do lists. Anyone here? To-do lists. All right. How many go for it digitally? Uh, some people. Okay. How about sticky notes? Anyone else besides me? Old school. All right. I see you. My people are here today. Uh, we have sticky notes and representing different things. Okay. We're starting to consider Monday because that's coming up tomorrow already. Tuesday is a huge day. Oh, my Tuesdays are packed. Okay. I probably shouldn't Wednesday, but yeah, a little bit of Wednesday's in there too. You know, there's some other things that I'm thinking about. There's work around the house that I have not done. I've not taken care of. Well, the kids, that's very significant. Well, um, work stuff, that's definitely on my brain right there. And then, yeah, there's some finances that are getting a little tricky. And, uh, you know, there's some people, there's some conflict right now I'm dealing with. And I got, hi, how's life going for you? Do you ever feel like this? Like this is life? Like you're just trying to navigate like, I got so much. And people say, I'm so busy. I got so much. It's overwhelming. I got so much. And worry, and worry, and worried. I'm worried. Well, the YMCA has something called spiritual vitamins here in Auburn. Someone gave this to me. I had never uh, realized this before. They gave it to me as spiritual vitamins. What's this? Well, in the back is a Bible verse. The YMCA here in Auburn, putting the C back in the YMCA. And the Bible verse is from Exodus. And it says, And he has filled him with the Spirit of God, with wisdom, with understanding, with knowledge, and with all kinds of skills, including making artistic designs for work in gold, silver, and bronze. It's the first mention in the Bible of being filled with the Holy Spirit. And the worries are starting to roll off me as, uh, <laughs> as the Scripture comes out. And what does the Scripture say? I'm filled with the Spirit. God gives wisdom, understanding. His grace is sufficient for today. He's going to help me with planning and setting limits. His favor is on me, following Jesus. And what a difference Scripture makes. Our minds are renewed. Our hearts are changed. And now what happens? I say, oh, hey, Monday, Tuesday. There you go. I see you Wednesday. That's right. Some conflict going on. Work. The kids some stuff in the house. All right. Put it right there. Scripture has the final say. I'm trusting God. And now it's in my back pocket. Amen. I'm abiding. How can I serve you? How are you doing today? What a difference, right? Two ways to go through life. Overwhelmed, worrying, pressure's all on me, or shift, prayer, Scripture, 
Trust the Lord. Abide. Now we're ready. And Jesus is showing us the difference, so we'll make the shift. Here's the final shift. And the question is, do you want to get well? Worriers become warriors. It's a choice, going from worry to worship. Jesus says it in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Three times Jesus says, do not worry, do not worry, do not worry. Turn to the person next to you and say, do not worry. <laughs> now look the other direction and say, do not worry. <laughs> now let's all say it together. Do not worry. So biblical, so good, so freeing. You know what it means in the Greek? Do not worry is what it means in the Greek. <laughs> It's a misplaced trust. Instead of trusting the Lord, you're taking that trust and you're putting it somewhere else instead. And it means we need some new habits daily. We need some new habits. You probably noticed in your bulletin, there's a handout and it's daily grace questions because you say, what does this look like to follow Jesus in my daily life for us to do it together? Here's some new questions for you to consider. You can put this in your Bible, on your refrigerator, by your bed. These are the questions. When have I prayed fervently today? Prayer eliminates worry. How have I repented today of my worry and of other things? When have I asked to be filled with the Spirit today? Or am I just trying to do the Christian life on my own strength? today. Next, who did I equip or encourage today? Serving others, getting focused on other people, and how have I spread the gospel today? Psalm 5110 is another prayer you can pray. Create in me, O God, a pure heart and renew a steadfast spirit within me. There's a call to be different from our past, from other people, from the culture. It's a call to honor the Lord and seek first his kingdom and righteousness means to seek first his glory. I want to close with a couple examples that I caught my attention this week. The first one, Kanye West. I was listening to his quote, and his life is changing. Now that I'm in service to Christ, my job is to spread the gospel. You know, there's people who follow Jesus 5, 10, 20 years who still don't own that. Now that I'm in service to Christ, my job is to spread the gospel, to let people know what Jesus has done for me. I've spread a lot of things. There was a time I was letting you know what high fashion had done for me. I was letting you know what the Hennessy had done for me. But now I'm letting you know what Jesus has done for me. And in that, I'm no longer a slave. I'm a son now, a son of God. I'm free. Spirit moves uh, like the wind. You don't know who's going to be changed next, who's going to turn to Jesus next. Uh, Kanye is a new Christian. Well, what do you do if someone's a new Christian? Welcome them into the family, right? Following Jesus together, and you pray for them. Now, if Kanye was at our church, what would we do? We'd start to do life. We'd have conversations together. We'd um, want to help him to learn how to pray, how to read the Bible, right? What his gifts are, and how to use those for the Lord. He's, he's starting to move that direction. But when someone's a new Christian, you pray for them, pray for the people that are discipling Kanye, right? So that's an example of someone making a shift in their heart in going for it with Jesus, taking those first steps. I remember when I trusted Christ, my life was messy. I had so many areas, I had no clue what it looked like to follow Jesus. So someone that's a new Christian, sometimes we judge them and say, oh, they should have their whole act together. Well, we want to pray for them and, and build them up. Here's the second thing that stood out to me, going for the kingdom. In Iran right now, they say it's the ninth most intensely persecuted place for Christians to live ninth most in the world. But do you know what's happened over the last 25 years? 25 years ago, it was estimated there was about 100,000 Christians in Iran. And today, that number is growing exponentially. And they estimate about 3 million Christians in Iran. Incredible what God is doing in Iran. Some of them are going to Turkey to escape some persecution. Some are just taking it on the chin. Uh, but we need to pray for our brothers and sisters in Iran as they're seeking first God's kingdom in a very intense place. They could be filled with worry in that condition, but they're going for it with the Lord. And then the last one I want to mention is Francis Chan, who's been a pastor in California for many years and a leader in our country. And uh, God's used him in so many ways. And he just announced this week that he and his family are moving to Myanmar, which is a long ways away, different country. And this is what he says, fishing in the same pond my whole life, and now there's like thousands of other fishermen at the same pond, and our lines are getting tangled, 
And he said, it's kind of like this. Started fishing in this pond. Then I build my house on the pond. And my friends come and build their house on the pond. And we don't really do that much fishing anymore in the pond. We just talk and play and hang out. And he said, it's like there's a pond five miles away where the fish are so hungry and no one is fishing at that pond. Now, if I'm called to fish, I'm going to take that hike. And he sensed God leading him to Myanmar. It doesn't mean you're more spiritual if you go overseas and you're less spiritual if you're here. It doesn't mean America's second rate. But he sensed that calling from God and he's looking around the world. His family went to Myanmar recently. You know what happened? As they went from hut to hut, shared the gospel, people turning to Jesus, people getting baptized. It's incredible what God's doing there. And he looked and his wife and they just thought, Are, is anything we're doing back in the States comparing to any of this? And they just sensed like it was God's time that they would go to Myanmar together. And looking back in America, he says, you know what? I've tried too hard to be too clever instead of just sharing the gospel with people. I've tried in this day and age to be too clever, you know, and do the dance and tricky instead of just sharing the gospel in love with people. So that's what he's learning in the shifts in his heart that are happening in their family. Imagine that, just picking up everything, go to Myanmar tomorrow and living for the Lord there. And, and so how is God leading you? How is he leading me? It's personal, it's together, but here's what we know. It's not to have a heart that is self-consumed and have pride and defensive and worry. That's not the heart Jesus has for us. Jesus doesn't want us just not to worry, but instead he wants us he wants to give us life and worship and live for him. And ultimately, what is he doing in this passage? He's not just teaching. He's not just forming an institution. It's a movement and an awakening that starts in the heart. It's a movement and an awakening that starts in your heart. Let's pray. God, thank you for challenging us. Thank you for comforting us. And God, I pray we would make the shifts as our hearts are revealed and worry, and materialism, and pride, and the idol of being comfortable are exposed. There's so many traps every day. Help us to have new habits, to trust you, to repent, to follow you, to do it together. We say yes, Jesus, to worship, to the movement. You are working in our hearts, the growth, the healing, the transformation. And we say yes to you, Jesus, and putting you first, loving you first, not what you've created, but who you are. We praise you together in Jesus' name. Amen.